All right. Thank you, Ron. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I was looking at the queue of questions and saw that someone actually liked our graphic that we put together for this and uh, you know, showing that the Fed in there with the hourglass on top, it, it seems like uh, in the bond market, we're just here waiting for the Fed. Um, and so that, that was kind of the implication of this today. And when I think about waiting for the Fed, uh, they've been extremely accommodative. There's been a lot of uncertainty around uh, their behavior and the path to get us uh, out of this extraordinary policy, and I'll address that later on. But as always, I like to start off with what the global landscape looks like. And so uh, let's start off by diving into the charts. And so uh, first of all, just looking at uh, world GDP forecasts, um, we, we, you know, for all this talk about revisions downward and slowing growth, uh, you haven't seen this really from the global economy. In fact, uh, I guess that, that's what happens when you have a lot of different players in the economy, albeit you know a roughly you know uh, sixty percent driven by three or four nations. But when you start to look across the various economies, uh, really looks like a very very strong recovery here. And I always like to point out that you know for the pre previous five years or six years prior to the pandemic. Uh, you just saw this kind of stable growth rate in the in the globe, and it, it was roughly three to three six, three seven. Um, really, there's a lot of prints around three percent. So when I think about you know kind of the potential output in the global economy prior to all these extraordinary policies, roughly three percent feels about right. And when you look across the globe, you are seeing some slowing or at least the data is underperforming where it was uh, roughly 12 months ago, or at least you know it's, um, it's outperforming by less. And what I mean by that, if you look at the, the Citigroup economic data surprises, what they tell you is they, they aggregate a bunch of economic data prints, and what they end up doing is comparing today's snapshot of that amalgamation relative to the average experience of those data points over the last 12 months. So uh, again, don't, don't look at the context and numbers. I, I really never understood what the actual magnitude is, what a minus 5,000 or a plus 2,000 means, but it's definitely just the magnitude from zero that we're looking at here. But if you notice here, uh, we had this big collapse last year. We all know about that. And when you look at the recovery, the recovery started first in China. Right where the data started to outperform, well, you have to recall that, that you notice that the orange line went down first as well. So um, you're seeing this that the Chinese economy seems to be underperforming on average where it was roughly a year ago, but it still is a bastion of growth. Uh, we can argue about the slowdown and, and how far that goes, but it's not going to be a deterrent and a drag on, on GDP on a global basis uh, anytime in the near future. But the U.S. is the one that a lot of people have been talking about. Um, this, there's been this concept of stagflation, slower growth rates. And uh, I keep hearing the phrase from a lot of pundits. I see it in research where growth has peaked. And I like to remind everyone that growth itself likely hasn't peaked, but it's the growth rate that has likely peaked. And I was talking to one of the analysts on the desk today. And we were discussing this concept of stagflation and slower growth. But you know, uh, if you go back and look at it, and I'll talk about this in a minute, um, our growth rate right now and the forecast for those growth rates are significantly above what was our trend in the GFC. But notice here still, the global economy is still firing above where it was 12 months ago. It's not growing as fast and the data is not as fast as it was, but it's still above those rates by showing all these positive numbers. And that's now being driven by the Eurozone and EM. And again, as we've been talking about for the last six to nine months, is that the, the, the concept of the vaccinations, remember the US was kind of the leader on this. We were the leader in the recovery. Notice that too, when you look at that black line, we were the ones hitting that potential first uh, and stronger. There was the dip in the Eurozone, but notice that you, you find that we're starting to see a reopening of those economies, and you're starting to see these vaccination rates permeate throughout the emerging market world as well. So I think the signs are there for the, the global recovery to continue, um, albeit at a slower rate than we have seen. So if we look at kind of some hard economic data, and I, I like to look at the manufacturing component, uh, because uh, although the U.S. is more of a service economy, manufacturing is something that drives global growth. And what we've done here is we we take the, the color shading here, the darker the color, the stronger the prints relative to the last two years, uh, the darker the red, and apologies for those that don't see colors, but the darker the red you, is, is, is really the most extreme negative prints. And notice there that April of last year is really where all, all of that pain was really at. But when you look at where we are in the cycle here on the manufacturing component, and not shockingly, when you read about 
uh, the challenges and the tribulations that you have within the supply chains today, manufacturing remains very strong in the developed world. And it's kind of a mixed bag in the emerging markets, but the ones that are contracting in that are just Mexico and Egypt. Uh, the rest are kind of neutralish to slightly growing, but notice that the the strong manufacturing output here in the global in the developed world. And so um, again, this concept that growth has rolled over, uh, it's hard for me to see that from the economic data today. I can see the rate peaking uh, because we had some extraordinary policies, amount of fiscal stimulus, which i'll I'll show in a minute, that really drove that. But first, before we do that, let's look at the long-term rate of GDP growth. And this is done uh, on a real GDP basis. So real, just remember, is stripping out the components of inflation from uh, our, our, our gross domestic product. And so if you notice here that the, we have a dotted line here from the regression, that's the trend line. So that gives you the average growth rate over this long-term period. And if you see that we cross below that trend, right, trend line during the financial crisis, if you look at the slope of that dark black, uh, sorry, dark blue line uh, relative to the dotted line, what you see is that, that that slope is lower. So that slope is the rate of growth. Uh, because this is a logarithmic scale. And so what you find there is that we had a lower growth rate than the long-term growth rate uh, since the, the post-World War II era in that post-GFC era. But notice what's happened. This recovery, the dip down, uh, up into that blue shaded area is where, we're, where we are today. So yes, U.S. GDP uh, on a real basis is above where it was. Uh, so the drawdown has been complete. Um, and you could, if you took that trend line just from 2008, or I'm sorry, let's start in 2009 and draw it to here, you would see that we've really got back on that trend line growth. But notice the shaded area, and these are the forecasts, not from Double Line, but the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And you notice that the slope of that line looks a little bit steeper. So the idea here is that the US is gonna to continue to be one of the big drivers of growth uh, and looking at the economic data set, which I'll walk you through, sure looks like that for now. And so if you wanna add the inflation components back, and this is really what growth looks like, it's nominal growth. We can, we can all try to uh, ignore inflation, but we know inflation is rampant within the prices. Uh, no one can buy things in a real basis, you have to buy them in nominal dollars. But look at the nominal growth that's forecasted for 2021. And this forecast is done by taking uh, fourth quarter consensus estimates. I'm sorry, it takes also, uh, we're looking at the third quarter estimates because we don't have uh, GDP print, it comes out the end of the month. But the, the consensus for third quarter real GDP plus the fourth quarter GDP with what we know in the first half of the year, um, my lights are going out here in the double line office. Give me a second. All right, so anyway, thanks everyone for uh, doing that. I guess I have to do that every once in a while so we don't go uh, dark there. But you'll see that, you know, taking that with our own internal forecast for what we think CPI is in the remainder of the year gets us to about an 11% nominal GDP growth. Phenomenal growth rate, especially when you couple that with a minus 2% growth, nominal growth from last year. So we've more than got ourselves out of that hole. And if you look back at this chart, what you see here is the last time we had this type of nominal growth was back in the early 80s. And remember, nominal growth is real growth plus inflation. Inflation was a lot higher back then. Um, so, you know, this real growth rate is very, very strong. But look at next year's estimates. Now we use the IMF. I'm sorry. Yeah, we use consensus estimates for 2022 plus the consensus estimate for CPI. And notice that nominal growth rate, 6.4 percent, something that we haven't seen really since the, the strong economy that we had in the mid aughts. So again, yes, growth rates have likely peaked, uh, but it doesn't look like they're falling off a cliff at this point in time. So again, uh, it's pretty interesting to see this and these narratives out there that, you know, it, it's almost you, you watch TV and, and you, you watch the punditry and you find that it seems like we're going to a recession all of a sudden. And it just doesn't look like that when looking at the data. And so if you take these estimates out there and you do it in nominal GDP, now it's a different period uh, looking at the nominal GDP. We're just using the last 40 plus years here, uh, and what you start to look at, or I'm sorry, it's 30 plus years, we're gonna go back to trend line growth and nominal GDP. And so that's very strong that says we're back on track for this recovery. Uh, we'll see how good those forecasts are, uh, but for the time being, it sure feels like uh, in general that the, the US economy remains relatively strong. Now, one thing that uh, we found was that there's a strong correlation between uh, one of the indices that the, that the New York Fed created called the Weekly Economic Index and GDP. Now, why we care about this is that GDP is a very slow moving thing. 
Uh, I think if you recall, uh, former chairperson uh, Yellen said GDP is a noisy indicator. I, I think she probably wants to retract that statement, but it's very slow moving. It's quarterly. Um, it comes out with a lag. And so it doesn't, doesn't really have its pulse on the economy where the weekly economic index tends to have a relatively decent correlation here. And yes, it looks like U.S. GDP is going to be lower. But if you just assume that this relationship is relatively close, it still implies something like a 7% uh, GDP on a year-over-year -year basis. So in general, this looks pr relatively strong here. Uh, this GDP is actually in real terms. It's not in nominal, so it doesn't add the inflation component back. So looks like 2022 is going to be a pretty strong year, uh, absent some, uh, some massive uh, developments to the downside in the next two and a half months. And how do we get here? Well, obviously, there is huge, huge support. Uh, we know that the Fed is there with the monetary support. Uh, we also know that uh, the fiscal authority stepped in. And just to show you the magnitude of this, um, you can see how fast the fiscal authorities came in. And further to that, uh, I've got my IT guy here now helping out. So uh, he's going to dance around the room and make sure those lights don't go off. But what you'll see is that the, the speed with which the fiscal authorities came in, and secondly, the magnitude of this. Notice this, that on a cumulative basis, we spent almost $4.5 trillion from the Fed just buying assets, right? So this is the monetary component, not the fiscal side, but we know that both came very quickly and did this. And look how long it took uh, to really start this process. And so uh, I like to always say that things that were extraordinary measures become ordinary measures. Remember when the Fed came out and said, we're going to temporarily do quantitative easing. There's nothing uh, more permanent than a temporary government program. And notice it's just part of policy now. And you've heard this even from Chairman Powell saying, even in good times, we may do some quantitative easing. So I like this chart just because it shows the magnitude. And again, the Fed is going to likely start reducing their asset purchases, but the balance sheet will continue to grow. It's the slope of this line uh, will diminish a little bit, but the, the Fed is going to continue to buy assets at least for the next, let's call it eight months or so, according to the chairman himself. And uh, Richard Clarida came out and kind of confirmed that today. So I talked about the fiscal authorities. They came in very strong. Notice here, too, typically uh, during a recession, the budget deficits expand. Uh, they start to recover. The deficits get smaller and smaller, but we still run deficits. Uh, you got to create something like the Internet uh, back in the late uh, 90s in order to get a surplus here. But notice that each time that we get into these new recessions, that the amount of fiscal firepower is greater and greater as a percentage of the economy. So there's nothing new here. Uh, but, the, but the positive attribute is that at least we're getting some of this growth back uh, to make the deficit look significantly smaller. And here's another way of looking at it is looking about the circulation of money. Uh, this is an inflationist favorite chart is to look at the top half of this graphic and say, look at the money printing. And this is truly money. This is money supply. So this is new dollars going to the economy. It's the year over year growth rate. And you can see in general that uh, money supply tends to grow. Um, there's no negative prints on here. But notice, even going back in this kind of post-World War II era, you'll see that the money supply had never uh, never increased in the magnitude that we saw in the last recession during the pandemic. And so we've, we now have a lower growth rate of money, but you can see here, we're still hovering in what used to be kind of that old school metric of, of trying to inject money into the system. That's kind of where we are today. So this is what will be the inflationist favorite chart to say, look at all the money printing, it's gonna to lead to inflation. And what we all know from the, from the pricing equations is that you can't have inflation unless you have both the money printing and you need monetary velocity. And so if you don't have that money velocity at the bottom, and notice how the velocity came down significantly. So this why there's money in the system, that's why there's money tied up in here. This is why you see also banks parking so many, much of their assets at the Federal Reserve on repo is because there's not enough uh, demand for lending and, and the likes for loans uh, out there in the marketplace. And so uh, we're, we're continuing to watch this to see, will velocity tick up? And thus far, it really hasn't. So that's why that money is kind of trapped in the financial system today. And um, so what, what's also kind of contributed to this environment is the Fed having zero interest rate policy. Uh, that's not going to change anytime soon. Remember, uh, Chairman Powell's also said that he's got to get through the tapering. That is the reduction of asset purchases. They've got to stop buying assets before they're even going to consider hiking. Those are two independent thoughts. And so what's happened here is that the Fed funds rate, once you strip out, once you adjust it 
for the inflation rate, what we call the real funds rate, is some of the lowest numbers we've seen. And what I find very amazing about this chart is that even through this post-World War II era, rates have never been lower on the front end of the curve on a real basis. And so that says a lot about the policy, how accommodated we've, we've been. So this is the reason you've seen asset prices recover. Uh, this is the reason that there's just so much liquidity around there, because on a real basis, um, you're just not paid to save money at this point in time. So another interesting chart that I really like is, well, I don't really like it because it's inflation, uh, but I find it very interesting that it's a shift in the dynamic of what we normally see. So if you take the inflation rates around the world, uh, you see here that we're in an uptrend globally. I like to say, in general, inflation is a global phenomenon. What I mean by that is that we all consume similar amounts of goods, or sum similar goods. Uh, we use autos, we use electricity, uh, we drink coffee, we, you know, we use fuel and petrol. And so what you see is that inflation tends to be a global concept. So when uh, absent, you know, some crazy regimes from a fiscal side uh, that can drive that. And you can think like, um, you know, Venezuela or Argentina, or uh, as a lot of people like to show Zimbabwe, uh, you know, <laughs> in the in the late 90s, early 2000s. And so what we, what I find most interesting here is when you parse out the world between de the developed world, that's DM versus the emerging world, EM, notice here too, for the first time in a very, very long time, Right. So since kind of those mid aughts again, the developed world inflation is greater than emerging market inflation. And typically this is a temporary phenomenon. Like I said, a lot of that has to do with some of the uh, behavior within the emerging world uh, that leads to some of those uh, kind of inflationary spikes in currency devaluations. But what you find here is that uh, in general, you're seeing this trend up in inflation around the globe. And not shockingly, it's because of you know a, a very loose monetary policy uh, coupled with massive fiscal stimulus across the globe. Um, so that's the inflation, how it's been. Uh, what we like to look at too is thinking about the inputs to inflation and the inputs to goods prices, and that's something called the PPI. Uh, so the PPI would be the purchasing price index, right? Uh, producer price index. Sorry about that. Now, and this is looking at the cost of goods. So these are input costs into here. And so the blue line is how is the trailing rate, the year-over-year -year growth rate uh, from the purchasing, sorry, the producers' prices over the last year. Notice that 8.3%. That's something that we never saw um, during during the uh, post GFC era. Notice there too that the highest rate we we'd seen post GFC was coming out of the recession. Right, the, the global financial crisis, it got to about four and a half percent, and it faded. Right, notice that the, those green line, the green bars and the red bars, those are the month over month changes. So what I why I'm focused on this chart is because notice how strong these prints have been in 2021. Um, the monthly data is extremely strong. This is not base effects driving that where we came off these reduced costs a year ago. Right. Remember, um, when we what we see here is that we see very strong month over month growth. And the prints we are seeing right now used to be the aberrations. They, they kind of look more like the norm right now. And again, this can be attributed to the redefinition of supply chains, uh, the backlog of just goods and uh, goods being delivered around the globe. Um, but what we find is that PPI tends to lead CPI by anywhere between four to seven months. And so. This means that we shouldn't expect this transitory component of inflation uh, to materialize over the very near term. Um, yes, I think when inflation moderates next year, moderate is still going to be a simply higher rate than we see. I'll address that in, that we've seen, but um, you know, in general, uh, this does not paint a very good picture for the Fed narrative. And if you notice and listen to Jay Powell, what he said over the last kind of his two major meetings and some of his testimony to Congress, if you go back to Jackson Hole at the end of August, or you go to the last FOMC meeting, he's talked about achieving the inflation goal. Transitory does not seem to be in the vocabulary anymore because it's hard to continue to say that. And investors have kind of woken up to this concept. Um, and, and I say investors, uh, but this is just the Google uh, trends. So you can go out there and see how popular trends are. And this is what you call a diffusion index. So what you see is when it's zero, that's the least popular, and it gets indexed to the most popular data point, that would be 100. So that's the way to interpret this scale. And so we thought you know, in early 2012, you know, back in February and March, where we got some of these, or, well, the data was from February and March, it came out like April and May where you got these surprise inflation numbers, 
all of a sudden people started to look into inflation. And that waned over the course of the summer, uh, the idea of COVID resurgence, the Delta variant, and just in general, uh, inflation fears were waning as people were buying into that narrative. And this chart is, is one I continue to look at. And it's like, oh, well, it seems that investors don't care about inflation anymore. And if you go to the last month, that, that's exactly where we were. Now, all of a sudden, if you look at this data, and it's an incomplete data set because it's not a full month, hence the dotted line, it's the most popular search it's been over the last uh, 13 to 14 years. So there is a huge uh, difference here in the opinion of someone like the Fed or, or some entity like the Fed and the average person out there on the Google. So uh, again, uh, this is something where I think people are seeing this, right? If you go out to eat, if you uh, if you go try to buy an appliance, you try to buy a vehicle, um, you try to send your kids to school, you got to go to the hospital or the doctor, you notice that it feels a lot more expensive than it was a year ago. So um, I think that the, the Fed is knowing this and they can't just sit here and say it's transitory forever. Um, and people are starting to wake up to this concept. So I, I myself am worried about inflation. Uh, I don't think it's a hyperinflationary environment uh, because we don't have that money velocity component I showed earlier. Uh, I don't necessarily think it is a stagflationary environment, but I think that inflation is going to be at, at a higher level for a longer period uh, than a lot of us thought at the beginning of this year. And so there's different measures of inflation. And so this is the kind of, I'll call it the pick your poison chart. Uh, you tell me what basket you want to have, and I can tell you what your inflation rate is. And so there's different measures out there. CPI is one of the most widely referenced. Uh, this is the core inflation. So it strips out commodity prices, which is kind of a joke too, right? Uh, tell, tell me one person that doesn't consume a commodity. Uh, but the Fed you know, and the BLS pulled commodities out because they're inherently noisy. Right, they go up, they go down, they have a lot of volatility. Look at things like natural gas prices, right? Uh, the, the, the daily vol and that's been in triple digits uh, for how much it's been swinging around. So looking at the measure of core, they tend to be stickier, uh, they tend to be less volatile, but notice when we've seen a huge spike both in CPI and PCE. Now you can say, okay, Jeff, you know, look, look at this chart. Well, look at those other three measures you show. They're kind of in that range of, of, of the kind of two to two and a half percent, which is kind of on par with where the Fed's targeting. Well, yes. So if you look at that, it's called the median inflation. So it doesn't look at the aggregate of the basket. It just takes all the goods, takes the median of it. So there is inflation there on the median, but it's not as exaggerated because some of those larger increases have bigger weights in CPI and PCE, things like housing and healthcare, um, which we all need, by the way. Uh, if you look at the core sticky uh, from the Atlanta Fed, those sticky prices are the things that are, by definition, sticky. They don't tend to go down as much. But you can see here, again, it's kind of moderated in this level. Potentially, that's something to look at. And then, um, as one of our PMs said in our investment meetings, or maybe it was one of our macro meetings, he goes, well, if you look at the trim mean index, which is something I've used because it gets rid of the outliers, we're right on, we're right on target here. It's somewhat you know, kind of on average inflation. And it's like, um, yeah, if you remove all the outliers, the things that are extreme, you won't get as extreme a reading. So notice that in that volatility as well. So uh, again, uh, not trying to pick on that person uh, that was making that comment, but again, you can choose which measure you want to think about. But the bond market price is off of CPI. The Fed focuses on PCE, uh, the personal consumption expenditure. So those are the things that, that we really focused on here. And, and really what's changed is the dynamic between goods and services. So remember what I talked about, strong manufacturing, and you couple that with what we saw in the PPI reports, the producer price index, right? The input costs are going up. Not shockingly, goods prices are going up. And this is even with some adjustments out there. So I recall talking to clients six, seven years ago uh, where they're saying the Amazon effect, um, that's what's driving goods down. I like to remind them that you know some of that's hedonic adjustments, which even though the price goes up, you, you're supposedly getting more value for it. So uh, the economists adjust that. But notice there that we saw this deflationary environment for goods really in the last five years of the last decade until we implemented tariffs. As soon as the tariff policy came from President Trump, what we found was that all of a sudden, the goods prices were going up. Not shockingly, right? You tariff goods, and yeah, someone has to pay for it. It's not the government pays that tariff, it's the end consumer. Then we had the, the pandemic. Notice how we shot up. So if you listen to kind of what, what I was talking about on webcast last year, I said, well, we're going to see 
when people start to go back to work, when people start to go out to eat, when the economy opens back up, will there be this handoff of consumption of goods over back to services? And so far, there hasn't been. What has what's happened here is services, things like dining out, going on vacation, uh, spending time at a hotel, some leisure exercises, those have rebounded to where we were really post GFC, roughly two to three uh, percent, with some with some volatility. But goods continue to remain elevated. Uh, we're here in LA. In LA, you look out on the porch, you'll see the backlog of the supply of boats. So you're finding that goods are more and more expensive, and so. This is hard to argue that's a transitory phenomenon, especially when you continue to get strong prints within those PPI data. So the bond market must be worried, right? That's the, that's the natural thing. So how's the bond market price and inflation? It's really not. Um, yeah, so these are break-even spreads. This is the five-year, so uh, five-year, 10-year, and 30-year. What a break-even spread says is, what does the bond market think the price of inflation is? And so this is the difference between tips and the nominal bond, what, what would make you indifferent to buying those two assets? So the bond market seems to think that over the next five years, we have a 2.7% inflation rate, roughly, or that's the price of inflation today. And so what's the disconnect? Well, likely over some period of time, we're going to get some relief here. Uh, we haven't seen these levels of inflation in, in many decades. So the bond market say, okay, we're going to price a little bit in there, but we're not going to price in this hyperinflationary environment, or at least, you know, a simply higher inflationary environment. Notice, though, over the last couple of weeks or the last month or so, something's changed. And that, that local low in, in the blue, red, and black lines was actually at the Fed meeting. Um, but I, I tell people, worry, you know, you can worry about this, you can look at this, but the the power of this metric is significantly less than it used to be. And why that is, is because the Fed's footprint in the tips market is very large. And prior, so this just takes the balance sheet of the Fed, how much they own in, in tips, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, um, and it looks at how much they own relative to the size of the overall market. And you notice they owned roughly 8% of the market pre-pandemic, and as they wrapped up their purchases um, across all the Treasury securities, they started buying more and more of the tips market. And so 22% uh, ownership of this market is by a static buyer uh, that doesn't have any intention of selling those assets to the market. And they're likely reinvesting coupons. So um, you know what you'll see here is that the Fed's percentage of ownership is likely not to go down anytime in the future. Plus, you take a couple of big inflation-linked funds out there uh, here in the U.S., and the, the ownership of that of that side of the equation is quite large. So I think it's lost a little bit of its um, uh, forecasting power or its interpretation of the market, but it still remains uh, break-even spreads. When, when I'm saying it, break-even spreads still remain quite elevated. So uh, I talked about the economic activity. We looked at the price of goods, the price of services, but notice here too the strength of these things. So the PMI uh, data for manufacturing, it's called the Purchasing Manufacturing Index. Again, this is the diffusion index. So 50 is kind of the midpoint. Anything above that says that you're getting more activity. You're having contractions if it's below that. But notice the strength here. Both services and both manufacturing continue to remain strong. This is why I don't see the U.S. economy rolling over in the near term. We still see the strength of these inputs. And this isn't just price input. This is the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the activity that's occurring in that marketplace. So why is that? Well, the consumer continues to remain relatively strong. Uh, the labor market has started to recover. Um, uh, what I see in this chart is that the difference between the U3, which is the official unemployment rate, and the U6, which is the underemployed, those gaps tend to widen a little bit in a recession, uh, but there is this continual gap between the two areas. Um, notice, too, that this was literally off the charts. We had to expand the scale uh, to look at the employment rate uh, or the unemployment rate from uh, from last spring, and we've had a very strong recovery here. But you can always notice that the damage to labor is done very quickly. It takes a long time to recover here. And so uh, we haven't got back to those low rates. Remember, that was the, one of the lowest unemployment rates we'd seen in the post-World War II era going into the pandemic. Uh, but we are seeing market improvement. Uh, that slope of that line is, has increased downward significantly as of late. Uh, some of that is, too, is the labor participation dropped um, in, in the last report. And so uh, if you take the amount of workers and divide by the labor participation, that's how you get the unemployment rate, are, are those that are unemployed. So what you're seeing there is a big improvement. There's another thing which I'll show in the next slide. But 4.8% is thought to be, or at least 
prior to the last uh, the last expansion was thought to be around kind of foolish employment. And I say full-ish employment. Uh, so zero unemployment rate is not the, the objective here. Um, there's always going to be some turnover out there. But what, you, what you've also heard from the Fed um, is that they like the inclusivity. So there's uh, certain cohorts that have been disproportionately affected here. Um, you know, they think of, uh, you know, uh, uh, things like uh, minorities, uh, also female workers uh, haven't had as robust of recovery as some of the male workers. And so the Fed was is, has had this mantra of more inclusivity. And so I think that in general, uh, the Phillips curve has been dead. Um, I think it only worked when it was created back in the, the, the early 80s. Um, but in general, uh, the, the people thought that at this level you would get inflation. I don't think it's because the inflation is coming from the, the worker and the labor. It's coming from the cost of goods at this point and the supply problems we have and commodity prices. So what's happened out there is the unemployment rate, I'm sorry, those receiving unemployment benefits has diminished. And you can see here on the stacked line, a stacked bar chart, uh, bar chart, the blue line is the official data. This is the regular state unemployment. When you look at continuing claims, this is the number you get. And you can see there prior to March of last year, that was the only thing out there. Um, you also saw that um, uh, getting those state unemployment claims, there was all, uh, over 24 million people receiving that uh, last spring. And you can see there's a big improvement here. The slope of that line continues to recover. The moving average, uh, if you look at like the last you know four weeks or the last three months, continues to draw downward. It's not on this chart, but trust me, it's there. But there's also these other areas. So the red bar was uh, a program created during CARES. Uh, that allowed people who fall out of the state unemployment program to continue to receive benefits. So this was called the PEUC. Uh, that that program uh, was one uh, because the states act differently. Some states will give you three months of benefits. Some will give you up to 12 months of benefits. So you can see there that there was this nice support uh, that was uh, to the consumer or to the unemployed out there for a long period of time. That That program expired at the beginning of September. Also, there was this extraordinary measure called the PUA, uh, the, the PUA uh, program, which it actually expanded benefits to people who were not traditionally eligible. So we had this other cohort that if, if you didn't have enough time at your job or you were a contract worker, think the Uber driver or someone, you could be eligible for these benefits as well. And notice that was a big set of the economy. There was roughly 10 to 15 million people who were receiving this type of benefit uh, that weren't traditionally eligible. That peer, that program also expired at the beginning of September. And then there's the extended benefits and there's some the little federal employee program as well, which they're rounding errors you can't really see in our charts. But notice now, so th I say this is the make or break moment for the economy. There's been a lot of debate whether the unemployment uh, rate is, remains elevated because people were getting free money. Uh, they'll use this chart as the free money example. Um, or people uh, having trouble finding workers because they're getting these benefits. And really the data so far, if you look at the states that remove some of these benefits early, uh, they don't necessarily have lower unemployment rates in their area or the job growth has been lower in those areas. I think it's a function of the jobs available, the worker skill set, not necessarily um, you know, a, a function of uh, the locale there. But what you find here is a huge decrease in the people receiving benefits. So we're going to test that theory over the next couple of months that was this economy driven for the last few quarters? Uh, was it driven by just these superfluous benefits that were given out? Or maybe they were necessary, but these e extra benefits that were given out. Um, and will we see more folks come back into the labor force because of it? So far, the data is a little mixed. Uh, but we'll know in the next couple of months as these programs have expired. So way less people receiving benefits. And if you look at the overall economy and you just add up the number of workers, and so this doesn't adjust for birth rates or, or anything out there <clears throat> or death, what you find is that there's 5, 5 million fewer workers today than there was uh, pre-pandemic. So think about this. You, you, I showed you GDP. Real GDP is back to where it was. It's, it's above its uh, previous high. It's at an all-time high. Nominal GDP is at an all-time high, and we've done that with 5 million fewer workers. So that means productivity is up, but also some of that is, is also saying that government spending's in there, right? We, you saw how much the Fed's bought. I mean, we've, we've spent on a budget deficit 11% of GDP to get here. So continue to watch this chart. We'll see if there's improvement. Uh, we just got the latest payrolls report. Uh, it was a little disappointing. The expectation was 500,000 jobs. 
um, uh, it was 196,000 if memory serves. And what you also had was a revision upward to the previous month of roughly 130,000. So uh, the miss wasn't as bad as it looked, uh, but you'll see that you know there's still a lot of room to replace the workers we've seen. Some of this is you know uh, the, the schooling system, you know people staying home. Some people said, look, I don't want that job anymore. You know, I, I just I, I don't want to be exposed to people, or I don't want to do that. I want to do something different and potentially redefine themselves. So uh, the good news is the jobs market continues to grow. We got the jolt state of jobs openings today. Uh, they decreased from last month. So there's fewer jobs than there were last month, but there's still over 10 million jobs uh, available uh, as that latest jolts report. And so the income component, uh, real income has, has increased uh, since the pandemic. Um, but a lot of, but if you strip out the government uh, transfer payments, that is the what the government sent people. Uh, income is right back to almost where it was uh, pre-pandemic. So hasn't been this really big increase there. What you need to do that is see an increase in wage growth, and we're starting to see that. The red line is average over the earnings, so uh, it gets a little noisy. Why it gets noisy is because it depends on the makeshift. So uh, during a recession, usually wages don't go up. But remember, in this recession the lower income strata was disproportionately hit to the downside. They're the ones that lost their job because we shut the economy down. So that means those that are remaining, uh, you see a higher uh, amount when you do the average. And so it destroyed that. Notice when people came back to work uh, and we started getting more of that lower wage job, uh, all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, uh, average hourly earnings uh, wasn't increasing as much. So it's a bit noisy. I like the blue line better. Uh, the blue line tells us uh, it's from the Atlanta Fed. It's the wage tracker. It's one I've used for, for many years. It compares what you earn today relative to what you earned a year ago. So it keeps the cohort consistent. Um, and you can see here that wage growth is kind of at the top end of the range it's been in over the last seven years. So wages have been growing between 3 and 4%. And this is for non-supervisory uh, employees. So this is kind of the median type of worker out there uh, that you find. So um, we'll see if wage growth continues to accelerate, uh, but right now we're at the top of that range. If it breaks out, potentially it's the catalyst to keep this economy going and the strength we've seen, uh, but potentially it's also there for a little bit of inflation. So what does this mean for the bond market? Well, let's take a look, and uh, as my boss likes to call it, the bloodless verdict of the market. And so uh, what does it say? Well, uh, high quality assets have not done well this year. Uh, the more risk you take, the better you've done. Uh, you can see that here for treasuries, agency, mortgages, things that are government guaranteed, negative rates of return with treasuries and investment grade, single A being the worst performers in the market. Um, why would investment grade be so poor in, in a strong economy? It's because it has a lot of interest rate sensitivity. It actually has more interest rate sensitivity uh, than, than the treasury market. And so that's what's driving that. Uh, if you look at high yield, uh, high yield's done quite well this year, uh, especially the lower credit quality stratum. Uh, but if you look at this, what you find is that also the high yield market has significantly less interest rate risk uh, than, than the investment grade market. So some of that is a function of that. But also remember, there was some distressed pricing last year, uh, which has led to a pretty decent return or continues to be a decent return within the high yield market. Uh, emerging markets uh, have suffered a little bit. Uh, the corporate uh, EM is shorter in, in terms of that interest rate sensitivity or less interest rate sensitivity, shorter duration uh, than the EMBI, which is the broad-based market, has more sovereigns in it. But notice here the floating rate components. Uh, leveraged loans, bank loans is the other name for that. You can see here that that lower uh, credit quality tier did extremely well at almost 15% year-to-date. This is through last Friday uh, as the bond market has closed yesterday. Uh, but notice here, too, E, e, uh, all, all the rankings within the loan market are paused as well. It doesn't have interest rate sensitivity. It's more tied to LIBOR, uh, which will go to SOFR. Um, and so it's on the front of the curve. It has, it has, it's a floating rate asset, so it doesn't have that. So what's worked this year are things that are float or have very low duration, but still have economic sensitivity. So you can go out to the ABS market. You can look at you know, the lower tier of CMBS. Uh, you can look at also in the CLO market, which is a way of securitizing the bank loan market. All very, very strong assets and including non-agency RMBS. We all know about the strength of the housing market there. So that they leaves the ag down about 2%. Active management, active uh, managing duration uh, can help you with that as well. And then you have stonks, you know, as, as, the, as the youngins like to call them, stonks up about 16.9%. Uh, it's a little bit uh, lower today uh, from that, that level as well. But very, very strong year for risk assets. And again, it's been all about managing duration. So 
uh, something we've been talking about all year. I continue to think that's the right positioning uh, for the remainder of the year and potentially into 2022. Um, so the other thing we got to look at is ownership. And I bring this chart in here uh, because it explains a little bit of the dynamic that we saw over uh, the course of the summer. And so we saw after rates peaking in 10s and 30s back uh, in uh, the end of the first quarter, there was this big rally that kind of transpired. And some of that was because of those yields being offered out there, foreign holders stepped up. This data is only through the second quarter, so it doesn't give you uh, a, a, a snapshot uh, as of the last you know, three and a half months, but it shows you that foreigners did step in to buy. So the problem with these type of charts is it takes time for this to come through. Uh, the market's already moved ahead. But the Fed has been the, the buyer of the mark of the Treasury market. Foreigners came in as hedging costs had come down, uh, and the yield opportunity was quite strong there. Um, so you've seen that I, I, anecdotally from what we hear from trading desk, it seems that that's moderated a fair amount. So uh, again, think about what that means for the overall treasury market. So real quick before I look at rates, notice that red line too. That red line, you remember the Fed is going to start reducing how much it buys. It's not going to sell any assets. We're not going to repeat what we saw at the end of 2018 uh, with the unwind of the balance sheet, but they're going to be buying less and less. So why this is important is that if foreigners moderate their purchases, the Fed moderates its purchases, and we continue to have supply, domestic holders have to pick up their purchases. So you got to ask yourself, do you want to buy this treasury market, given some of the dynamics I put together earlier in the slides? So looking at this, uh, the charts, uh, a lot of people focus on 10s and 30s. Uh, notice there, too, from that kind of over oversold, overbought, crazy neuroses we saw back in March of last year. If you draw the lines on that chart, we bounced right off of that in this rally uh, over the the third over the second quarter and really going into the third quarter as well. And we've seen a bounce off those levels, both in 10s and 30s. Um, and so uh, real, when we look at these charts, it says, I think that these lows are in for this part of the cycle. Uh, obviously, we can have another recession. Uh, we can try to retest the the all-time lows here. But in general, we're, we're flirting again with getting back to those levels we saw in the first quarter. But now let me take your attention to the top two panels that we have here. Left-hand side is the two-year. And the two-year has been selling off re really since the Fed meeting. And you can't really see it in that chart. Uh, when you look at it, it was, it was hovering around 20 basis points. It felt like forever. And we're at a whopping 32 basis points today. Or we were on Friday. I think we're about 31 today. Um, but notice also the five-year. So the two-year is going to be keyed off of Fed policy. Right? It's going to think about what is the future path of interest rates, when's the Fed hiking, and at 32 basis points, it says the bond market thinks maybe the Fed hikes by the end of 2022, it's somewhere between the November and the, um, and, and the December meetings. So that's the way the market's priced today. But the five-year, the five-year broke through this trading range it was in. We got to a little over 100 basis points uh, in the first quarter. I think we got to 101, if memory serves. We flirted with that again. Uh, we couldn't break through. Then all of a sudden, here we go again. And so to me, this chart looks like the five-year is going to probably the next stop's 150. And then if we get there, you know, potentially up to about 180 or so, 175, 180, which makes sense if you think about where we are, the health of the economy. The five years is usually used as a proxy for the overall economy, uh, and that's why it's starting to reprice as well. It's thinking that maybe that inflation, we saw that in, in the break-evens, that those break-even spreads are going up, plus we probably get a little bit of real growth. So all in all, uh, these charts really argue to me, uh, especially on the front of the curve. And remember, a lot of the credit markets are priced off this five-year part of the curve. Uh, I was talking to someone on the sell side this morning. Uh, we were talking about the credit markets. It's like, IG, there's more issuance in the five-year point than you see in the tens. You know, the five-year is kind of the, the big issuance point. Then you have your 10-year. Then you have your kind of insurance buyers out in the 15-plus part of the curve. So uh, to me, this is a thing to watch here because a lot of the assets that we traffic into tend to be more keyed in this part, what we call the belly of the curve. So this, to me, this is, this is something that, that is, should be on investors' minds right now because this is driving all rates up right now. This is not just a back-end phenomenon uh, that's happening on the 10s and 30s. But notice the long bond. The long bond has a little more room to run uh, to test those highs that we saw uh, back in the first quarter. So uh, again, at, at, at these levels of inflation that we're seeing right now, um, the only reason to really want to own that asset is, is something uh, as an offset to risk in your portfolio.
Uh, so the infamous copper gold ratio, uh, the blue line is copper to gold. Uh, it's been signaling that rates should be higher. Um, even if you don't uh, overlay it and, and go ahead, it's the directionality. Notice the directionality since the summer is saying to pull rates up. Uh, we've seen that. We kind of saw like them come down, the copper gold ratio go down a little bit. But here we are, it argues for a 10 year closer to 3% um, than 160 for sure. So um, you're seeing this in economic activity. Uh, the bid for gold just hasn't really been that that strong here. Uh, gold's kind of trading near the lows it's been for the last quarter or so. So what gives, right? So one of it was for, foreign buyers stepping up, uh, stepping into the plate, buying treasuries. But also, if you take net issuance and you pull out what the Fed bought, we actually had negative net issuance. So the supply was actually being drawn down um, in, in terms of the amount of treasuries in the marketplace. Plus, you had the amount of um, uh, of the uh, what's it called? The Treasury General account was out uh, was very elevated. That got drawn down, so Treasury didn't need to issue as much uh, many securities out there. And so all of these events came together uh, in the second quarter, driving that down. But notice we do have supply again. Um, Treasury issuance is probably going to be reduced next year relative to this year. And in fact, it kind of coincides with the Fed's purchases. So I think this tailwind you got in rates, uh, plus you had the Delta variant. We overshot to the upside a little bit in rates uh, in the near term. Uh, I think that there's the potential for rates to continue to press upward. So I think we retest those levels on, on tens at least, if not 30s by year end. Uh, and if we go through it, the next stop could easily be two to two and a quarter. From the tenure. Um, if you look at the investment grade corporate bond market, it doesn't offer you a lot of value today when adjusting for inflation. So the way this is calculated is using uh, the yield to worst on the investment grade corporate bond market, uh, and because it's a longer duration asset, it has about uh, about an eight and a half year, or you know somewhere between eight and nine years today. Uh, we use the ten year break even uh, as a way of proxying inflation there. So. Uh, you can see on a four instead of using the in the mirror inflation, look at forward looking because that's what your yield's trying to get you to. You see here that you have a negative real yield. So it doesn't really help you if you're trying to maintain purchasing power by going to the IG market. But you also have to remember spreads are relatively tight. So not only are rates low, but spreads are tight. So it's hard to argue that rates going up here uh, should command a massive premium. Now, uh, the the person who's astute would say, yeah, but Jeff, look at what happened in the 90s. Spreads were a lot lower. Well, also, rates were a lot higher, and so the all-in yield was significantly greater. And so sometimes people don't just only look at spread, they look at the yield. And so um, at this level, at 86 basis points of the spread, um, you know, it doesn't look cheap by any means, uh, but also there's not a big default problem out there in the corporate bond market. The coffers are stuffed. Uh, there's a lot of liquidity out there. So it is pretty, uh, you know, the default risk is, is likely very low, but you have a lot of interest rate sensitivity. So you can go to the high yield market. Whoa, look at here. Uh, we're kind of uh, near the post uh, pandemic lows here, or even post GFC tightness in terms of spread on the high yield market. Um, you know, spreads have widened a little bit as of late. Uh, you'll see a little bit of activity too here. Remember, this is priced closer to the five year part of the curve, uh, but at least investors here have a chance to potentially outstrip that inflation, right? You take the five year at roughly 107 basis points a day, 295 spread. Um, you know, it's not exactly the math, but it gets you to like a four yield. Um, if you think that break even spread of inflation over the next five years is two six, you have at least a chance of the real yield. Again, benign default environment on the horizon. At some point, uh, all this debt will hurt, uh, but there's no maturity walls on the horizon. Therefore, um, you know, spreads are likely to remain relatively tight in this area as well. We all know about the housing market. I won't belabor this. We, we talk about this every webcast. Uh, all of us do here at Double Line. Inventory is tight. You're seeing a little bit of supply come to market, and you've had one of the most monstrous prints uh, in housing prices. This is the FHA, FHFA. It goes back a little further than the Case-Shiller data, 19.2% uh, versus 20% on Case-Shiller. Uh, but in general, uh, we expect prices to moderate here. Uh, some areas may be a little susceptible to some declines, but you've got to solve this inventory problem to do that. So the real estate market still looks, our residential mortgage assets still look pretty strong.
Same with the CRE, the commercial real estate <coughs> market looks pretty strong. Uh, if you look at the property prices, uh, for all the, the reports of the demise of commercial real estate, uh, prices continue to march upward. Now, um, the reason people think there's a demise there is that people are looking at office space, uh, wondering about the future of the work environment. Uh, you also can look at the hotel industry. But so we bring that in here and look at the delinquency rates, and you can see that they've been improving significantly across all types. But notice what's at the bottom in delinquencies, things like industrial properties, multifamily housing. Uh, and also office space. Even though at Double Line, we're not using a lot of our office space, uh, we're still good citizens and, and good uh, good folks, and we're paying our rent. So you still see that, yes, maybe we rethink what we want to pay for rent and how much footprint we want to have or where we want to have that footprint. But you're seeing here that office delinquencies really aren't really marching upward at this stage in time. So the commercial real estate uh, market is, is a part of the market we like, and it's something that we definitely had heavy allocations to uh, really since uh, late summer of last year where we increased those exposures and we continue to maintain those today. Uh, the emerging markets, as, as, uh, as our senior uh, PM there says, uh, 350 is kind of the average. It gets rich at 325. Uh, 400 is where they, they want to add. 375 is where it starts to get cheap. And here we are at 360 once again. Um, and so in general, this market seems a little bit fair. The fundamentals are improving. As I mentioned, uh, those vaccination rates are going up. You look at the inoculations there, but also uh, you start to see, uh, if you look at the economic activity uh, from the emerging markets, you go back early in, the, in this presentation, uh, you see how strong the emerging markets are right now. So, um, you know, rates, back, it's going to be rate sensitive, rates back up a little bit. Uh, this is a part of the market we, we do like. Uh, we're somewhat neutral on it right now. We'd like to see those spreads widen out. Uh, again, it has more interest rate sensitivity, so we'd like to see something happen there. Uh, rates would maybe could widen spreads a little bit. and could be an attractive opportunity to pick up a little more emerging market debt. And then lastly, the dollar. Um, the dollar has had some strength over the summer. Um, you know, it's it sold off since the what we saw in the flight to quality trade last year. Uh, kissed that 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 um, that bottom that we saw back in 2017, kissed that quite well, bounced off of that. Um, so we've been neutral on the dollar for the last couple of months. You know, we're thinking maybe at a 95 level, maybe start dipping our toe back in uh, to buy some non-dollar assets. But at this level, we just want to wait and, and let the market play out. What, what you haven't seen as of late is a massive strength in the dollar because you've seen this latest rate rise over the last three and a half to four weeks uh, happen globally. It hasn't just been a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, you've seen this in the eurozone and even JGBs. Uh, shout out to JGBs for getting up to 10 basis points uh, on the 10 year out there. Maybe it's a nine or something, but uh, that, that's a big move from zero. So let me show you valuation real quick. So if you look at valuation, long term valuation, I think at the gray line is the risk premium uh, for various areas. And then you have standard deviation bands around them. IG corporates, rich. You saw that from the spread chart. Uh, when you look at kind of every metric out there, they look rich. Uh, they're rich for a reason, though, right? The default risk is benign, but they do have a lot of duration risk. And so that, that's some of the challenge with that market today. Uh, you look at agencies. Agencies are, are government-guaranteed uh, asset. They still look a little bit cheap. Um, uh, on this metric, it depends on what you're buying in that space. Some of the market is a bit stretch we think in valuation there was a massive amount of buying from banks in the second quarter uh, as they had to get rid of their when the the leverage ratios were reduced uh, had to hold higher tier one capital uh, they seem to be piling into that trade uh, got got things kind of cheap again uh, or sorry got things kind of rich again got back to fair value uh, from what we were looking at there's a lot of that market that was very rich the agency market just hasn't kept pace with some of the duration. Been a stable, stable asset class, though. Done very, very well. Trades like a rock. Uh, still looks cheap on this, this metric. CMBS, but uh, kind of fairish value there on that. Uh, asset backs, kind of fair. Uh, bank loans, high yield, look rich. Uh, bank loans seem to only get to this one sigma rich area. Uh, if you look at the bottom left, high yield corporates uh, look a little bit cheaper uh, than investment grade, but by no means cheap on this metric. And the one thing that looks really, really egregiously rich today on this long-term metric is tips. And it's because of the run that you've seen there. Again, it's not the most expensive it's been in history. Uh, you got to go back to the post-GFC uh, era to get to that. Uh, but it's not very often we get into this one sigma rich range. It doesn't seem to last for a long time. Uh, I could see this getting a bit richer. Uh, but the problem with the tips market, if you're right on inflation, you're probably going to get hurt on duration. So we still remain relatively neutral on tips today.
Uh, munis, munis are um, on the pricier side. Uh, they're pricey for a reason. Uh, look at your fellow Congress folks and what they're trying to do with taxes. So uh, I'm, I'm not shocked to see that. That's a, that's more of a tax policy trade than necessarily something signaled there. Uh, the non-sovereign market looks cheap. Uh, this is on the currency basis. Uh, the problem with that is the duration can hurt you. But when the currency moves, uh, we think that's going to be a good place to be. And lastly, EM uh, on a spread basis starting to it's had widened out a little bit. It's kind of hovering this cheaper uh, kind of region.